I want you to take a moment and think back to that decade called the 1970s. And there was some weird stuff going on during that time period. Uh, I, and I was part of some of that. Um, for instance, there was a lot of fads going on. My Sunday morning outfit as a teenager that I wore to church, I had black shoes that had four-inch heels on the back. I had a green leisure suit where I had a scarf around here with a gold ring on it, so it made a nice little bow like this. And in my room, I oh, and I had a, a gold chain or a silver chain on the wrist here. And in my room, I had a pet rock. Now, there were other things from the 70s, and one of them, if you remember, was called the mood rings. And these were rings that if you put on your finger, they, your body heat made them change. And whatever color they changed to, that was the emotion you were feeling at that moment. You got this little card with it, probably about that big, that had all the colors on there. And, and if you were this color, that meant you were having anxiety, or this color meant you were angry, this color meant you were um, you know, having feelings of love. There was no scientific evidence whatsoever that these things worked. But they were very popular. In fact, they were so popular, they actually appeared in a Peanuts cartoon. In 1976, there was a Peanuts cartoon where Peppermint Patty gets so mad at Charlie Brown, her mood ring blows up. There's a story told of a husband who was unhappy with his wife's mood swings. So, tried, so trying to figure out how she felt, he bought her a really nice mood ring. And he said, you know what? It really worked. He discovered that when she was in a good mood, the ring turned green. When she was in a bad mood, the ring left a big red mark in the middle of his forehead. <laughs> and then as she walked away, she usually said, maybe next time he'll buy me a diamond. Anger is something that Scripture talks about. Anger is something that Jesus talked about. And we've been going through... The words of Jesus, looking at how should we live in 2017. And we come to these words in Matthew chapter 5, 21 to 22. And they really ask us the question, what color is your mood? You have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, Anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus puts anger high up on the list. If you're angry with someone, it's almost like murdering them. So we're going to look at some important truths about anger in our lives, but also what it says to do with it. And one of the first things we need to look at when we talk about the subject of anger, when we talk about anger, right away we believe all anger is sin. Well, our first point is this. Not all anger is bad. Anger is not always sin. There is a type of anger which the Bible approves of, and it is often called righteous indignation. Now, that is not to be used as an excuse to be angry. All Scripture is saying there are times when it's okay. Let's look at some of those. We find in the book of Psalms that God gets angry. Psalms chapter 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels anger each day. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus uh, is described as being upset, no more than upset. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now, in the New Testament, there's two Greek words for anger. One means passion and energy. Now, the other one means agitated or 
boiling. I think, I think you can guess which one's the good one <laughs> out of there. The one, passion and energy. There's examples where this type of biblical anger is okay. In 2 Samuel 12, uh, King David, he gets very angry when Nathan the prophet tells him about an injustice that is being done to somebody else. And we know the classic story in the Gospels. Jesus, the time Jesus got really angry and he let it show, he walked into the temple overturned the money changers' tables, grabbed a whip, and drove them out of the temple. Now notice that these examples, and any other one you can come up in Scripture, these examples of anger never did involve self-defense. They were never angry because of what somebody had done to them. They were angry because someone was being mistreated. They were angry because someone was doing something wrong. They were angry over sin. Now, here's another passage we need to look at when we talk about anger. You know, there's two types of anger, good and not so good or bad. But Ephesians 4.26 gives this word a warning. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, let's break that verse down. What's the first couple of words? It says, uh, Paul is saying, be angry. So he, he just told us, be angry. There's times to be angry. It's a command. But be angry about what? Be angry that you got cut off on the highway? Be angry that you went through the drive through and when you get home, they forgot to put your french fries in the bag? Be angry that you picked out the slowest line at Walmart or wherever? No. Be angry because of sin. Be angry when someone is being mistreated. Be angry when there is injustice happening. Be angry against that which is wrong. But now, in the rest of the verse, comes a warning. That whether you're talking about good anger or bad anger, this applies to both of them. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. This introduces us to the second thing we need to see about anger. There is good anger. There is bad anger. But whether it is good anger or bad anger, the principle is this. Anger must always be dealt with whether it's righteous indignation or you're really angry with a situation or what somebody has done, the rule of thumb that covers all of it is anger must always be dealt with. Why? Because have you ever noticed when you're angry, you do dumb things? You say dumb things? Merton, William Merton of Mount Clemens, Michigan, once wrote into Reader's Digest and told them the story of a fight him and his wife had. And they were at this dinner party, and it, it kind of started with just innocent words. And then they decided, maybe it's time to go. And as they got out the door, on the way to the car, it escalated. When they got to the car, inside the car, closed the door, it was a full-blown argument. They were almost yelling at each other. And they're driving down the street, heading home, and really not paying attention. All of a sudden, they realize they're in a section of town that is not very good. <laughs> it's the bad side of town. And so they stop arguing long enough to lock their doors. And then they get right back to it again. And he made a statement to his wife that he said it was almost like lighting a match and putting in a gas can. She blew up at me. And finally, she yelled at him, Stop the car! I want to get out! And so he pulled over the curb, hit the brakes, unlocked the car. She got out, stood there for a few minutes, looked around, got back in the car, and very sheepishly said to him, Take me to a better neighborhood. <laughs> well, that broke them both up. They laughed. And they laughed. And then they realized what they'd been arguing over was something very foolish and something very 
dumb. Anger can cause us to do dumb things. That's why it must be taken care of right away. That's why we do not let the sun go down on our anger. We don't let it stay around. Because anger can cause us to do hurtful things. Anger can cause us to ruin relationships. Anger can cause us to ruin our testimony and witness. Anger ruins our day. Think back to this past week or this past, the past month. Think of a time when you got angry. How did the rest of your day go? How did you feel the rest of the day? How did, that, how did those moments go? Not very well. That's why we should not let the sun go down on our anger. And what that verse is really saying to us is the number one rule to deal with any kind of anger, whether it is righteous anger, because what did Jesus do with that anger? After the people left the temple, he let it go. He wasn't talking about it the next day or the next day. So the number one rule for anger is do not let it stay. Do not hang on to it. Because when you hang on to anger, it hangs on to you and will not let go. Two sisters were arguing most of the day, fighting. That evening as they prepared for bed, their, their little ritual was in, in their beds. One would kneel on one side of the bed and the other one would kneel on the other side of the bed. And the eight-year-old started in first with her prayers, and Mom was standing there, and she goes, Dear Jesus, bless Mommy and Daddy, bless our cat and dog, and then she ended. And the mother tapped her on the shoulder and says, Ah, oh dear, you're forgetting someone. And she looks up and sees her sister kneeling across there, and then she goes, Oh, yeah, and Lord, bless my ex-sister. <laughs> Anger causes us to view people differently than we normally would. Anger changes how we treat others. Anger changes our attitudes. And if we hang on to anger, pretty soon it's a poison that seeps into our heart and our mind and our soul and our attitudes and our emotions and poisons everything we do and touch. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, Let's take that phrase and look at it from another point of view or another angle. What steps do we need to take so that the sun does not go down on our anger? How do we handle it? How do we get rid of it? Well, we need to follow a couple passages of Scripture. Ecclesiastes 7.9 Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. For anger resides in the lap of fools. Okay, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. Another way to put that in our modern day language, in our street language, is to say this. Don't have a short fuse. Don't fly off on the handle. Do not be quickly provoked. And then James 1.19 brings in some other good advice. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Now, when the Apostle Paul, or when James says, take note of this, he says, okay, hey, pay attention. <laughs> are, are, are you listening? To, take note of this. This is important. You can ignore what else I said, but take note of this. And then he says these words. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. What that verse is telling us, as that anger builds, we have those moments, you know those moments when, Somebody might say something or do something or something might happen and all of a sudden we're just going, mm. <laughs> When that happens, James is saying, step back. Do not act on it right away. Practice a little self-control. I think there's three things we need to remember when we have those, like I like to call those mm, moments. Number one is, do not blurt out the first words that come to your mind. When you are angry, you have no problem finding words. You have no problem what you're going to say. And that's the reason you need to stop and go, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I probably shouldn't say that. Do not blurt out the first words that come to mind. Secondly, do not let, your, let the anger build up. 
In other words, this is the part, do not hang on to it. Don't go to bed with it. Don't think about it the next day. Don't, don't keep it in your life. And the third one, and this is the one I like, is use your mind. Now, when I say use your mind, I look at it this way. When anger builds up in your life, when you have those moments, you need to ask yourself four very important questions. Question number one. And, I, and these questions help you get rid of that anger. It helps you so that anger does not, so the sun does not go down on your anger. The first question, am I misinterpreting what someone said? Now, you know how that somebody says something <clears throat> that sets you off. And maybe they had no intention of doing that. They probably didn't mean it. And we jump to conclusions. So did I just misinterpret what they said? Maybe I better go ask them or talk to them. The second question, am I misinterpreting what someone did? Maybe someone does an action and we take it the wrong way that it was meant to be at us, to get back at us. And they probably weren't even thinking about us. Again, if we ask that question, go talk to the person. Three, I think this is a very important question. This is one I ask myself all the time. Is it really worth it to get angry over this? So what if you went and ordered a pizza and you brought it home and that inch around the outside edge is a little black? <laughs> you still got 90% of the pizza there. Or that person cuts you off on the highway and they slow down in front of you. Is it really worth it? And as we ask ourselves that question, I think it really puts things into perspective that a lot of the things we get angry at are really actually foolish and make no difference in the grand scheme of things. And then the fourth question is this one. Am I going to allow someone else's lousy attitude to ruin my attitude? If that person's having a bad day and they want to dump on you, am I going to let them? That brings me to an illustration about this. Um, years ago, David Pauley, who was a keynote speaker and a uh, psychologist, was almost in a very horrible accident that could have taken his life. He was in a taxi cab, and the driver of the other vehicle hit them, hit them on the side in the front end by the fender. Well, when the accident happened, the driver of the other car, who was definitely at fault, shouted obscenities at the taxi driver. However, the taxi driver simply smiled and waved at the obscenity shouting man and wished him well. Well, Paulie couldn't believe this, so he tapped the driver on the shoulder and he says, excuse me, why did you do that? Taxi driver then explained, many people are like garbage trucks. They run around full of garbage full of frustration, full of anger, full of disappointment. As their garbage piles up, they look for a place to dump it. And if you let them, they'll dump it on you. So when someone wants to dump on you, don't take it personally. Just smile, wave, wish them well, and move on. Believe me, you'll be happier. Well, in the book he was writing, he had, Mr. Pauly adds these words. What about you? What would happen in your life starting today if you let more garbage trucks pass you by? You'd have a lot less of these kind of moments. Dealing with anger. The key is do not let it stick around. Deal with it right away. And we deal with it with patience by being slow to act, slow to speak, Asking ourselves all those questions, especially the one, is it worth it? And then not letting it hang around, not nursing it, not keeping it, not stroking it, but letting that anger go. Saying, Lord, I give this anger over to you. And we especially 
keep anger out of our lives, when we let the garbage trucks pass us by and we simply wave, you have a good day. You go dump on someone else, not on me. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we will have those moments. In this coming week, all of us as we go out, maybe even the rest of this day, but in this coming week, we're going to have those moments where we, that anger wells up. And it's not righteous indignation. It's just we're upset about something. We're mad about something. Maybe it's some, what somebody said, what somebody did. But Lord, help us, as your word says, to be slow to speak, slow to anger. Not having a short fuse, not easily provoked. But may we be able to step back and say, wait a minute, why am I getting angry about this? And not letting the sun go down on that anger, but dealing with it. That hour, that day, but when anger hangs around, it's a long-term residence in our lives. Help us to be slow to anger. We pray this in your name. Amen.